Ladies and gentlemen, before I introduce our distinguished panel this evening, I'd like to just take a little look back at what has been an extraordinary, what's been a, a tumultuous nine months or so in the law relating to publication. Uh, nine months ago, uh, the press were ca complaining bitterly that uh, a privacy law had been brought in through the back door uh, under the auspices of the Human Rights Act and on the shoulders of Mr. Justice Eady. Uh, they were complaining that um, conditional fee agreements were making it impossible to uh, defend actions in privacy and indeed uh, in defamation, uh, that uh, lawyers, uh, like some of the ones from the firms uh, who are represented here tonight, uh, were cashing in with success fees of up to 100% of their, of their base fees. Added to that, there was after the event insurance, which was making it almost impossible for the press to defend uh, actions both in defamation and in privacy. Um, things uh, were, uh, you know, this new species of injunction um, w wasn't quite being called a super injunction nine months ago. That sort of came in about five or six months ago, I think. But uh, this new species of injunction whereby uh, you weren't even allowed to mention the existence of the injunction uh, itself was gagging uh, the free press. Libel tourism was uh, bringing our justice system into disrepute. People with almost no connection to this country were able to use our courts to sue uh, in libel uh, when only a very small percentage of, of a publication was actually read by anyone uh, here. Uh, scientists and academics were being prevented from commenting freely uh, on uh, therapy areas and on drugs that they had concerns or observations about. Uh, and uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that uh, the law of publication was working very much to strangle uh, a free press. Now, um, that was nine months ago. If we look at what's happened in the last nine months, uh, it is really quite extraordinary. Um, certainly, uh, the, 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 the emergence of the three T's, uh, that's Terry, Trafigura, and Tugendhat, um, have uh, meant that there have been some significant changes, certainly in relation to uh, super injunctions there perhaps appears now to be a recipe for melting uh, super injunctions through Twittering and the Twitter sphere and the blogosphere. Um, whereas Mr. Justice Eady had been perhaps uh, vilified uh, and in some cases very personally uh, attacked by people like Paul Dacre, for instance. Uh, Mr. Justice Tugendhat has been uh, depicted in the press, in, in one particular organ of the press, I think he was described as a being akin to St. Thomas More, riding to the, uh, the rescue of the free press. Um, certainly, there seems to have been a rowing back on the, the uh, use and power of super injunctions. Uh, in addition to that, there's been a, a hugely effective campaign run by Index on Censorship uh, and others, which has led to a, a libel review. Um, and, and major changes perhaps will come as a result of that. In the area of cost, there's been the uh, review by Lord Justice Jackson, uh, where he's looked at uh, costs in civil cases uh, and uh, has come down very firmly in favor of the fact that uh, the losing defendant should not uh, have to pay uh, the success fee and indeed the after the event insurance. He's, he wants to cap the success fee at 25% uh, and he wants the successful claimant to pay it. And, to compensate the successful claimant. He wants general damages to rise uh, by 10%. Jack Straw, of course, carried out his own uh, review on um, success fees, uh, and, and his suggestion was more radical, uh, that they should be reduced to 10% of the uh, successful lawyer's um, fees. Uh, in addition to that, we have, and we have in this room tonight, so many of the key players in everything that's been happening over the last uh, nine months that we could, frankly, refight uh, some of these cases here and now, if we chose to. But we have Simon Singh uh, here uh, as well, who uh, won a, a major victory, uh, as I'm sure all of you will know, uh, in the Court of Appeal uh, just a week or so ago. Uh, Simon, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, wrote a piece in The Guardian about the British Chiropractic Association, uh, where he um, heavily criticised their claims that their uh, therapy and treatment uh, was uh, successful in helping to treat uh, a variety of childhood uh, ailments such as asthma um, uh, and so forth. Uh, he used the phrase, I think, not a jot of uh, evidence uh, and uh, bogus treatment. 
uh, was another phrase that he used. It was on the comment page, however, uh, of The Guardian. Um, but uh, Simon won a major victory. He was sued in, in libel by the association. Uh, he won a major victory in the Court of Appeal a week or so ago, uh, which uh, effectively, and we'll hear expert comment from the, the lawyers on this, uh, redrew the boundaries between the two defences of justification. Uh, on the one hand, the more difficult uh, defence to run, if, if Simon had had to run that defence, he'd have had to have called reams and reams of scientific evidence, uh, which uh, the association would have had to have rebutted, and it would have taken forever and cost a lot of money. Um, but the judgment effectively redraws the line between that defence uh, and the defence of fair comment, uh, which, as you'll know, is a, is a much more, uh, is, 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 is much less expensive uh, defence to run for a start. So a vast amount ha has happened in a very, very short space of time. And I'd like to begin this evening by posing the question, has it been a good six months for the free press? Uh, and in order to answer that question, we've got uh, an, an expert panel assembled for you. Uh, to my uh, extreme right, uh, only, only geographically, ge geometrically, <laughs> um, we have Nigel Tate, although he is uh, wearing a badge. If you can't see it, uh, it, it reads, hey, I am hated by The Guardian, I think it, is, what it, <laughs> is what it reads. He had to get it specially made. They didn't, uh, they didn't give it to him. Uh, but Nigel, Nigel Tate, for those of you who don't know, is uh, a uh, senior partner with the firm Carter Ruck. Um, <laughs> Bestill your, your sneers and hisses for a moment. Um, and uh, I think never has the Frontline Club promised to live up to its name more graphically than uh, it does tonight, with Nigel braving it into the lion's den. Although I did notice that he walked in with about six or seven lawyers from Carter Ruck. So um, not only has he got numerical support, but just be careful what you say. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, Nigel is a, is a major figure and uh, <coughs> articulates the... Uh, position, uh, as it were, that you hear less often, uh, the non-journalist position, uh, extremely well. Um, uh, let me just, uh, of course, remind you that Carter Ruck represented Trafigura uh, in, uh, in that case that you will, uh, I'm sure, follow very closely. So that is Nigel Tate. Um, sitting to my extreme, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, it's extreme left, um, is David Lee, of course. Um, David is the Guardian's investigation editor. Uh, he's a long-standing and a well-respected reporter. He's uh, broken many scoops. I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, but he, uh, the revelations that led to the jailing of the Tory MP Jonathan Aitken, uh, disclosures of secret uh, payments by arms giant BAE Systems in the Al Yamama case, uh, just, just a couple. David is professor of reporting at London uh, City University and in 2007 won the Paul Foot Award for campaigning journalism. Um, sitting just to my right is David Hooper. Uh, David is a partner at Reynolds Porter Chamberlain. He's a, a lawyer with more than 30 years experience, um, has expert knowledge of defamation and intellectual property law, uh, has defended libel claims on behalf of many media organizations including the Sunday Times, Forbes, and Peter Wright, the former MI5 agent and author of the notorious Spycatcher book. Um, Simon Singh, I've always uh, already mentioned, Simon is a freelance academic uh, journalist, uh, author, and TV producer. Uh, he earned a PhD in particle physics uh, from Cambridge and studied at the CERN Center in Geneva before working uh, at the BBC Science Department on shows such as Horizon and Tomorrow's World. And as I said, uh, he's currently um, still being sued. I just asked him whether he is currently still being sued uh, by the British Chiropractic Association, and he tells me that he is currently still being sued by the British Chiropractic Association. Um, but uh, uh, they will no doubt be chewing over that judgment from the Court of Appeal from last week. So um, let's begin then, perhaps with Nigel. Has it been a rotten six months for you and a, and a great six months for the press? It's been a stimulating 12 months, I think. It's, it's terrific to be able to debate the subject of uh, freedom of expression, because uh, no one re was really that interested in it uh, a while ago. When I first started at Carter Rugg, um, a journalist actually won a libel action, Alan Watkins of The Observer, won a case. Uh, and, he thought, and people congratulated him and said, this is amazing. And he thought, well, why? And he looked up the court records, and he was the first defendant to win in a string of 51 cases. Uh, so the system was very satisfactory when I first started. You always won. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, as a claimant. <laughs> So it makes it more stimulating now to uh, see this freedom of uh, expression blowing so strongly uh, uh, and uh, affecting the courts. I think Simon won his appeal 
not necessarily because of the legal points that were made, although he had fine counsel, but just that the judges knew that if they ruled against him, they would have so much to deal with in the press that they just didn't fancy it, really. Uh, so the, the, the judges are running scared of the press? I, I think they are. I think I, I first saw this in a case called um, Sharman and Orion Press, where uh, a, the lead judge gave a judgment uh, in favour of the publisher. And he said, I, uh, Lord Hoffman has given a speech in Jamil Pro Publishers, and I know that if I find in favour of the claimant in this case, I'm just going to get it in the neck. You know, I can see which way the winds are blowing, and I'm jumping on the defendant's side in this case. He was very clear about it. Uh, I do think uh, this public debate does make a huge difference to the way judges interpret case law well, let's, and, let's and fact. Let's ask Simon, do you think you, you only won because the judges are, are running scared of the press at the moment? Um, I, think, I think it's it's partly that. I think the, the Justice Eady had a, a ruling um, on the meaning of the article and the possible defences. And, and I think the majority of people think that Justice Eady got it wrong, that, that there's a more, much more obvious meaning, uh, a less defamatory meaning, um, and that it, you know, it was a, on the comment pages of The Guardian, it comment is free, and I was commenting about the British Chiropractic Association, so comment seemed like the obvious defence. Um, so Justice Easy got it wrong. I think the Court of Appeal then had to decide, did he get it so utterly wrong that they could overrule him? Um, or was there enough margin of error whereby they felt they couldn't overrule him? Mm. And, and I think maybe that's what tipped the balance, was, was um, the, the pressure from the, the press, but also the pressure from the public. I, a year ago, almost a year ago to the day, um, I was at a pub called Pendle's Oak, a basement of a pub in Hoburn, and we just lost that first ruling. And we were going to have a, a it was supposed to be a celebratory drink, because <laughs> we didn't know we were going to lose. Um, but it turned out to be a, a commiserating uh, get together. And uh, we uh, got a little table and had half a dozen chairs around the table. Um, and then 300 people walked through the door. And these were bloggers, um, uh, human rights activists, scientists, journalists. Um, all of these people who'd all been angry about libel and who'd all been following the case and who all then went away and Twittered and blogged and wrote about it and talked about it and who then galvanised this huge um, you know, movement that's been going on for the last year now. Bring David Lee in there. David, do you, do you share the view that perhaps the judges are simply reflecting a, a broader concern amongst uh, the public that um, you know, things needed to change a little, the press needed a little more room to manoeuvre? Well, I think you're sounding a bit too optimistic, actually. <clears throat> I mean, we've had a lot of battles and a lot of ups and downs over the last year, but they've been defensive, really. <clears throat> it's been an attempt to hold the line. I mean, nobody thought before that you could go around suing people like Simon Singh just for expressing their opinions in a comment page about, you know, allegedly quack medicine. Um, nobody thought you could, you, I was super injuncted, right? That's my standing here in the traffic era business. I had no idea you could go and super injunct me, that you could, you could present me with a court order saying not only you're not allowed to publish this, but you're not allowed to tell anybody you're not allowed to publish it. That was a novelty, and we managed to fight that off, and Simon is managing to fight off this stuff. That's all just to get back to square one. I mean, it, I think it's trying to roll back an ever-encroaching tide of censorship. Is, that's how it feels. David Hooper, let me ask you, do you think that uh, you know, there was just a sort of sense of public revulsion, perhaps, that the judiciary picked up on in, uh, in Simon's case? I think they have to some extent. I think the key thing in Simon's case was that what went wrong at the first instance was uh, in front of Mr. Justice Eady was that he was saying technically there is an argument that this could be an allegation of fact. I and mean, he wasn't necessarily saying that that, that, was, you know, that was the conclusion people would have reached. But of course, I think people, what people have now picked up on is what a catastrophic ruling that is because you then have this, as you mentioned, this enormous trial um, and uh, what tends to happen is cases then get settled because nobody, nobody can fund the case. And I think the, the judges are now being a bit more proactive. Uh, they're saying, well, no, we really ought to try and make a decision rather than saying, let's give everybody their day in court, which is you know, great for the lawyers, but um, not so good for everybody else. And the other thing that I think they've be, been doing is that they have 
now given, because there's this balance between certainly in the privacy area, um, Article 8 and Article 10. Um, and you also got in super injunctions. The judges are actually saying, we really should think about Article 10. We really should be thinking about freedom of speech, rather than, as has been the case, giving you lip service. So I think there are real changes. I'm just, I'm just a little bit more optimistic, though, than, than David. Uh, we've been talking about what's going on inside the, the, the judiciary. Um, but Six months ago, the Lib Dem party conference um, endorsed the idea of radical libel reform. Professor Richard Dawkins stood up, and there was an almost unanimous vote in favor of major libel reform. Yesterday, the Labour Party manifesto talked about a libel reform bill uh, and radical reform of the libel laws. Today, the Tory manifesto said the same. I think it explicitly talked about public interest defense, libel tourism, and costs. So um, I think you're right. It, it, uh, we're fighting a defensive position at the moment, but when the new parliament starts, there's a real opportunity to start changing things more radically. Just before we, I just want to get a sense um, of the size of the problem, actually. How cowed were people like you, journalists like you, David, how more worried had you become in recent years with the threat of, of libel actions? How, how many academics were not writing papers uh, or writing critical articles because of the fear? Uh, I mean, I spoke to one media lawyer. He said he was getting one inquiry a month from academics who had either been threatened with a libel action or who feared that if they published what they wanted to publish, they were, they were going to uh, receive one. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I got a phone call today from somebody who is in the middle of a two-year-long case that I haven't had the foggiest clue about. And I think people will hear about it very soon. Um, there's a case going on between a cosmologist and an academic journal, which I think most people won't know about. There's a, a, a case to do with creationism and an academic journal, which most people won't know about. Um, I gave an interview to an Australian journalist, uh, Nick Miller at the Melbourne Age, who wouldn't write the article because his lawyer said, um, he, he was scared he might end up being sued in London. Now, I know there was, I've spent a lot of time with lawyers, and there was nothing wrong with my interview. Um, there was nothing libelous in it whatsoever. Um, and, and yet, that's the chilling effect. So it just goes on here, there, and everywhere. I was in one editor's office, editor of a scientific uh, journal, uh, and I was saying, you know, how bad is the problem? He said, it's not really such a bad problem. Within an hour, two people had walked in um, asking questions about libel which was limiting what that journal was going to publish in the next month. So again, an, another problem is I think we're, we're used to the problem. So we all um, redefine the lines of what we can and can't write. We just learn to live with it, whereas everybody else in the world looks at us and th thinks it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so, w what worries me is that <clears throat> somebody like me is fairly thick-skinned, and I've got a media organization behind me. Um, so I can fight these things. I may not be able to fight them off, but I can fight them. The people who are completely chilled are little regional papers with absolutely no money, academics with no money and no experience, scientists, and book publishers, who are, I'm sure David would agree with me, they must have experience in this, that book publishers just run a mile now from anything that's going to get them into litigation because it's not worth the game. They can't make enough money out of the books to fight libel, opportunistic libel cases, especially when they're bought by libel tourists. So there's a lot of chilling going on that by its very nature, you don't know it's happening. Nigel, do you, do you agree with that? Do you agree that there, you know, we had got to a, a pass where there was a real chilling effect and that you know, we've had a, <clears throat> a sensible correction? A little bit of a chilling effect is a good thing. I mean, one shouldn't write that so-and-so is a murderer unless one's got some evidence or one's investigated it. Uh, you shouldn't be allowed just to write So hang on, have we got it right at the moment? Is that the question? Well, um, I think the law is carefully balanced. It, I, I do understand. I think what the real chilling effect is the costs. Um, I think if you were, if a complaint came in and you knew that it would only cost you a few thousand pounds uh, to apologize, to settle it, or to fight it even in a tribunal, uh, tens of thousands of pounds, you might think about fighting it. If you're told it's going to be a million and a half pounds to fight it, even if you believe in what you've written, you're just going to say, no, I'm, I'm just going to 
So you, you, were, you would welcome, you would welcome that, that well, libel fees should be cut by 90%, not CFAs, no, but well, libel fees full stop. I wouldn't welcome that. The, the no, <laughs> I know you wouldn't welcome it, but would you agree that it would be a sensible and wise thing? No, I wouldn't. Very why, wouldn't. Why, why, not? Wouldn't. why not? Well, I, I, said, think we, I think we all know the answer. No, to no, that no, 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 just said it. Let me explain if anyone's interested. Yes. I think when I'm very often, you just said that it would be much more sensible if libel cases cost a few thousand pounds as opposed to one and a half million pounds. So therefore, I think why we'd have a less, le I think it's the costs that have the chilling effect, not so much as where right. we draw the, the line on the law. And therefore? Uh, well, um, can I explain why the costs have gone up? Uh, and then I don't think it's a simple solution to just cut success fees. And I, I'm happy to explain why. No, I, um, I, said, it, I said it's not about success fees. I'm not no. talking about 90% reduction success fees. I'm talking about 90 reduction full stop. Well, if, there's, if the work is reduced by 90%, fine. But the problem is, in the last 20 years, the costs have gone up for three major reasons. One is procedure. Lawyers suing newspapers have to do probably four to five times more work than they used to in the past. We have to, to send letters before action. Uh, we have to draft witness statements. We have to serve replies. We've got one procedure after the next. Uh, libel law is being reformed uh, again, and we're, going to be, we're given more work to do. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. But this is really simple. This is really simple. I, I know about that, and I think most people here would know that there's a lot of work involved. Yeah. But, I, but I, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna, not going to work for 10% no, no, doing no. the same amount of work. I mean, you can't ask me to, to cut no, my no, It's very costs. simple. It's really simple. You change the process. I just want to hear that again. You can't ask me but to cut my costs. You can't ask me to do no, no, five that, times more no, work, that, 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 but not, you're not, absolutely not charge right. five yeah. times more work. The, the, the system is wrong. The system demands you to it write does. those letters. Yes. So therefore, would you not agree that the system needs to change radically so you can have less work to do? You can go play golf. You can do whatever you like. <laughs> um, do do you not agree with that? I'm, I'm, in, yeah. I'm in favor of a two-tier system. Right. Um, I, I think you should have the Mr. Justice EDs for the really important cases, perhaps even yours, I don't know. I mean, if yours had fought uh, and you were accusing the DCA of actual dishonesty and, you, and there were witnesses on both sides, uh, I can see why you ought to have a proper high court judge uh, and possibly a jury dealing with that. But I don't think you need the Rolls-Royce service for bloggers, for what's written necessarily on the internet. I think you could have a really, uh, you could have a process like an employment tribunal where right. the paperwork is just cut down. But, yeah. it, it's fast and it's cheaper. Uh, and if the blogger or some, someone who posts something on the website will respect that, um, I think that's a solution. I don't so, think right. there's money for it. Let's bring David Hooper in there, because it was one of the suggestions, wasn't it? It was one of the recommendations in the Index on Censorship Report that there be a libel tribunal, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, do you favor that? And just explain to people how that could really reduce the, not only the cost, but the heartache and, the, and, and, and streamline the process of a, of a live life. You know, could I say one, one other thing be, um, before I do that? I mean, what Simon is saying sounds very dramatic and radical and sort of outrageous for lawyers, but it is roughly speaking what happens on the continent of Europe. I mean, yes. because uh, I mean, the, 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 there is under the Brussels Convention the ability um, for people to sue in their own countries in respect of publication. But they tend, you know, they tend not to do that. And if you do have a libel claim uh, in uh, Germany or France, it tends not to be very expensive. I mean, there is a fraction of the cost. And also, people seem to survive remarkably well not, not spending their lives suing each other. What, what are the key uh, ingredients of that system that enables them to do it for a, a fraction of the cost that, uh, that we have to do it? Well, I think the, the key thing, and it does rather tie in with what you say about tribunal, is that you get a very, very um, swift result. In fact, the result tends to support claimants, because unless defendants have really done all their homework beforehand, it's very difficult to defend a case in France. Uh, so, so, I mean, they, they tend to get results, and they may often get results that they don't deserve. But, I mean, the key thing is that it's cheap. And, I, I mean, what I have found, really, in law is that what People, I mean, people obviously like to win cases rather than lose them. But what people actually want is a quick decision um, by the best person available. And I think that's really what a tribunal would do, would, would be look at the papers and, and give a quick decision. Now, I'm not sure that writing all these uh, many letters, exchanging um, the, the um, reams of correspondence that we do 
exchanging all the documents that we do actually really um, gets a better result. It may in some cases. What people actually want is a decision. And I mean, people are quite good at taking bad decisions. Yeah, Brad, it, so this, is really, this is really important because what we're sort of saying is that if the damages are maybe less than £10,000, we should have a tribunal system. And we have a unanimous agreement on that, I think. Mm, that was a very good idea. I'm just wondering, OK, so we want a, a streamlined system, perhaps a two-tier system, a tribunal system. Um, all three parties have effectively signed up to libel reform. What other elements, key elements of reform, would improve our system? Should we, let's start. Well, why I was depressed was because the most recent thing that happened was that the tiny proposal for reform, which Jack Straw made to cut success fees to 10%, uh, was immediately nobbled and sabotaged by a little gang of Labour MPs in the dying days of this parliament, who managed by <clears throat> shouting object, basically, to, to knock it on the head. And who are those people? I'm, I think they are people who want to, who have sued, who would like to sue again. Politicians won't, when it comes to it, make substantial libel reforms because they like suing journalists. And the problem is that, you know, there's two sorts of journalists. There's greedy and cynical tabloid journalists who do bad things. And then there's journalists like us who are good. <laughs> <laughs> just as on the other Thanks side, for clearing that up. just on the other side, things. there are media lawyers who do good things. And then there are greedy and cynical lawyers who ramp up the libel costs. Yeah. So what? it's yeah. trying to square the circle. Okay, you know who you are. Dis <laughs> disparate groups of people. Okay. Well, well that was the certainly one of the problems of changing the law in Ireland, because they, they're all making a terribly good living, including Reynolds, whose mm -hmm. house was called Litigation Lodge. Yeah, yes. But, but the other sort of suggestions of, of things that perhaps perhaps a cap on damages um, uh, is something that we could... Oh, no, we, damages we, we, are quite irrelevant. Okay. Damages, damages are, are irrelevant. no longer a problem. Okay. I think we'd probably all agree. Damages okay. have been capped already. All right. Simon we? might not agree if he loses. It's, no, it's, it, it's the cost. <laughs> he won't mind about the damages. Yeah. He's going to mind about the million Couldn't pound costs. Yeah. You know? That's what happens with all of us. It's the costs that ruin us. What about the reverse burden of proof, the so-called reverse no, burden of proof? No, it's not such a big deal. Doesn't really, I'll any, tell you what any, would be a big deal. Anyone think that we need to tamper with that? On every committee, there ought to be someone with the word cost on their forehead. If you reverse the burden of proof, and the newspaper says, oh, prove, prove you're innocent, so that the claimant spends tens and tens of thousands of pounds proving that he wasn't in Oxford Street shoplifting on that day or something, uh, and then the newspaper apologises, the newspaper will be lumbered with a huge bill. Reversing the burden of proof will just is another way of just the costs going up. Uh, and it, no case I can ever remember has been decided on the burden of yeah. uh, proof. It's just uh, so no, OK, no one's signing up to, to, to that. Um, is there? I think, I think there's, there's another issue about just balancing the burden of proof so that the other side, <clears throat> claimants have to show proof of damage before they can bring a libel to that. Is that, is that a fair point. Simon, if I wrote an article saying something really nasty about you, um, you know, you've got a history of being a rapist or something, you, you couldn't prove damage, could you? But people would not employ you, people wouldn't ask you to be on children's television or doing anything else. You couldn't prove it, because what happens in libel, people don't tell you they've read the libel. Uh, people don't tell you they've, they've not signed a contract with you. Okay. They just leave you alone and then, move on. You can't I, prove damage. It's okay, impossible. I mean, the, the problem I have with the, the BCA is that the BCA, British Chiropractic Association, I just don't see how they would have been damaged in that they trade with their members. My article's written for the public. Um, they don't seem to have lost members. They don't seem to have lost, they may have lost members now, but that's not to do with my article. I don't think it's, it's um, for other reasons. But, but you know, so, so it would have been very helpful at the beginning if they could have proved that they'd really been damaged, if they're going to make me prove what my article but says that they mean. Can't, in most cases, 99% of cases, you can't prove you've been damaged. Okay. Then well, just, just one other very quick thing. If, if, if the majority of defences move to be comment defences, does that, obviously it doesn't change the burden of proof, but does it make it more a case of balance of probabilities rather than absolute proof on one side or the other? It's more of a black and white situation. I mean, in, in your case, uh, the court's decided it's your honest opinion. Uh, you'll have to prove some underlying facts, but I've read your article, and that won't be very difficult. Uh, they may try a case of malice against you. I'm telling you about your case, and you know more about it than I do, but I, you know, that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, if you'd made an allegation of fact that they were dishonest, they were knowingly promoting uh, bogus treatments, um, 
you know, you'd probably lose. I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's where the burden of proof becomes a real problem, because if, if you've got a common defence, then it becomes more balance of probability as opposed to being absolute proof, which is where I think it becomes problematic. Well, well it, yeah, goes so further, I, it goes yeah. further than that, because there's no reason why the British Chiropractic Association should be able to sue anybody. They're not a person with feelings. They're a, uh, they're, a, uh, they're a group, they're an association, they're not even incorporated. And there's no reason why companies should be able to sue anybody. Yes, and and in Australia, that's banned Just for now. people who may not be entirely familiar, uh, the, the fact that they were able to sue was because they happened to be, unlike many similar organisations, they're a company limited by guarantee. Is, is that, is that uh, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, that's right. Th this is a, I mean, are you talking about the reforms we would like to see other than reducing costs? Um, but, I mean, Davis raised an interesting yeah. one. Who should be able to sue? Well, the, the idea is in, in Aus can, Australia, can. yeah, a year or two ago, Australia passed a law that said large and medium-sized companies can no longer sue for libel. And that's what happens in America. Again, large companies can't sue for libel. And you, you present that to people, and they think, well, that just seems a bit unfair. You shouldn't be able to say what you like about a company. And sure enough, you shouldn't be able to say what you like about a company. You wouldn't be. And c companies will always have the, def uh, the defense of... of uh, malicious falsehood. If what you're saying is, is reckless, if what you're saying is malicious, companies will always be able to undermine your defense. So um, what it encourages is responsible and fair journalism um, without the uh, silencing effect that exists at the moment where giant multi-billion dollar corporations can sue um, bloggers. You know, we've talked about little newspapers, local newspapers, we've talked about <coughs> academic journals. We haven't talked about bloggers as well. All of these people can be terrified uh, by multinational companies um, suing them for libel. Yes, you used to have this problem with councils because uh, they used to sue and Derbyshire County Council sued the Sunday Times for damage to its governing reputation until Anthony Lester said, hang on, isn't that what freedom of speech is about? And there you do now have to have malicious falsehood. But the courts have not so far been willing and it doesn't look as if anyone's proposing to change to go as far with companies. I think what they may do is a halfway house, which is to say companies can sue, but they're actually going to have to show that they were damaged, which possibly right. you live with. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. I'm just sort of slightly aware of time. I think what I'm intending to do is just to have a, a similar sort of discussion relating to privacy, and then just to throw it open to, to questions. So uh, if you've got questions, just please um, store them up. Or should we have some questions? Uh, put it to who thinks we should have some questions now on defamation? Should we do that and then go on to privacy? Should we do anyone dying to ask? Questions? There was a hand over there. Quite, oh, there are quite a few Okay, yeah, let's have some questions. Good. Can you identify yourself and uh, say who you are, where you come from, and uh, yeah, what so your question I'm, I'm Caroline Byrne, and I'm representing myself. I'm wondering if the lawyers could please tell us how many super injunctions are you aware of that have been issued, and can you tell us the areas where they've been issued, whether that be philandering fathers or uh, people dumping toxic waste, and could you also please comment on the book publishers, libel freeze? And um, as a supplement, I'm wondering if you could please give us your best um, argument for muzzling Parliament. Okay. And that would be directed towards Carter Ruck. Okay, that's, uh, that's really three questions in, in uh, one, I, I, uh, I, which is a slight, slightly <laughs> cheating. Um, but, but all good questions. Um, by the way, I see Hugh Tomlinson is at the back of the room. And I asked him the same question on a radio program uh, recently, how many in, uh, super injunctions. I, I think he said sort of something under 100. And he reckoned that they're about Sort of maybe perhaps 50% were the celebrity type, John Terry type yeah. case, and the others were relating to more, um, to, to perhaps what people might regard as more serious matters. So that was, that was his estimation. I don't know whether there, people. There, there are no statistics kept. I mean, the people have talked of two to 300 a year, but I, um, we couldn't find out on what that's based. And I think that's an exaggeration. The Guardian, I think, uh, said that they. Um, they, they have re received 12 in the last year, whereas in 2006 they had six, and in 2005 they had five. But I don't know quite what that's based on. But we really don't know. This is something that's grown up overnight. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's a rather mysterious thing, actually. What happens in newspapers is <coughs> we get notified, and so we all send around messages from the lawyers saying, look here, there's a super injunction you're not allowed to talk about. And so we all learn these things we never knew before. Because they all say things like, oh, you know, famous TV person, you're not to say what he's done. So we all go and say, oh, you know, Andy Mars got an injunction and things like that. Mm. Right, okay, well, let's move on. From, <laughs> let's move on from that. Um, Nigel, you, you um, are probably in the best position to, if, certainly if you, you know, use your own practice as uh, the starting point for a, a calculation. 
Um, well, the Culture and Media Soci uh, Committee said that the government should keep records, the court should keep records. Um, uh, but my firm probably, in the last 18 months, has probably got about 12 super injunctions, I suppose. And, right. Uh, shillings may probably do more of that. Yeah. They tend to do more privacy work than we do, so... And we can ask them in a moment, because they're uh, sitting in the back but, of the um, <laughs> uh, we have a lot, I think we have quite a large share of the market, so I, I'd be astonished if it was in the hundreds uh, every year. But um, let me explain what they're about, really. Um, let me give you some examples uh, to, for protecting anonymity, obviously. Uh, we've got cases where... Um, People's computers have been hacked by uh, journalists, uh, stalkers. Uh, they're having a, a, in the middle of divorce proceedings, or they're in a particularly sensitive business uh, time, uh, and people have hacked into their computers. Uh, they found that they're victims of hacking. Um, they've got all their personal and business emails, all their financial details. Uh, and so they've got, gone to court to get an injunction to stop uh, all the details on the, held on their computer, which is a criminal offence, obviously, to hack into someone's computer, that being published. Um, recently, um, a celebrity uh, went to have a cancer test, uh, and before he was given the results, his doctor had already sold the results to a newspaper so that they could uh, splash that this celebrity had cancer. And that was before the celebrity knew about it and before the celebrity could tell uh, his or her children about it. Um, but a super injunction, I think, was, was obtained or that, that was stopped. Uh, it's common in blackmail cases, uh, particularly where uh, if, if a uh, male or female has gone out with, well, a lover has gone out with someone who's become famous after a few years, they, they'll try and sell that person's privacy to newspapers. But you're entitled to have privacy in, in your relationship, otherwise you can't have a proper relationship if everything that goes on is going to end up in the news. I don't think anyone's complaining about uh, but, but privacy these, these in these cases. These I think it. I think it. I think it's it's that, the that are being it's the fact that nobody can mention it at all, even that a person got an injunction. Well, that that's what worries Let's say people. you're a famous film star uh, and you've got cancer, and someone's selling your notes. Um, if David Lee could write on the front page of the Guardian that. Uh, Clark Gable, that's all I can think of at the moment. Uh, I know he's dead. Uh, but uh, has obtained an injunction to restrain publication of his medical records. Uh, you think, well, actually, what's, what's going on here? And you'd, you'd, there'd what's be loads of twittering, yeah. and yeah. people yeah. would be I mean, writing that, that, about that, that, it. And, and yeah. it would come out, because the person concerned would be under intolerable pressure yeah. to, to, to disclose what's wrong with them. Well, let, let me put that to, to David Lee, because you know, isn't that part of, you know, part of the problem with you know, living now is that if people know about the existence of the injunction, then you know we've got this kind of porous internet, um, you know, whereby it's just going to get out. And therefore, the need yeah. for a super injunction has never been greater. If you actually you have a genuine case and you want to put an iron fence around it, yeah. Well, I mean, th that's fine. You know, <clears throat> nobody's complaining about that. Um, the, the Lord Chief Justice made a statement after the Traffic Europe debacle, saying super injunctions should only be imposed when not to do so would destroy the whole purpose of it uh, in a case like the one night was describing where if you have an injunction against somebody releasing somebody's medical records then obviously it raises the question what what disease have they got um but that's not what happened in the traffic era case i sat there in court and uh, carter ruck um advanced a case that if it was made public that Trafigura had gone and got an injunction suppressing the Guardian from publishing this report about their toxic waste. Then um, the Guardian would use this to suggest that Trafigura were muzzling the press. And that would be bad for Trafigura because it would be, you know, hurtful to them and damaging. So the best way to solve that right problem, then. they told the judge, was would you please make an order muzzling the press so that they're not allowed to say this? Um, and I'm sitting there with my you know, jaw drop, thinking I'm in fairyland here. Uh, and that's a million miles away from <coughs> a doctor selling a celebrity's medical record. Let's just go back to, to Nigel on that, because you, the questioner also asked you to effectively to justify what you did in the traffic era case. And, and you know, the perception is, I know you don't perhaps go along with this, but the perception is that you know, this was an attempt to muzzle Parliament. Well, that's because the Guardian have written 100 articles talking about suppressing freedom of speech and they haven't published one explaining what actually happened. Okay. What well, do you um, explain to us what happened? Uh, 
traffic bureau um, had a boat which carried waste, which they uh, dropped off in Africa, and uh, they were sued by many people for personal injury. They wanted to know uh, urgently what had happened. Uh, they asked their lawyers to find out. Their, their lawyers commissioned a, a, a forensic report from someone who was not in Africa, but from a, a, a scientist who suggested what might be in the toxic slops or the slops. Um, that document was stolen. Uh, so it was legally privileged, confidential, and stolen. Uh, and it ended up in the hands of the Guardian. The Guardian, no one's suggesting the Guardian stole it. Um, and Traffic Bureau wanted a judge to decide whether it was in the public interest for that information to come out, which was inaccurate anyway, because it was a, just a desktop report, or whether it's in the public interest that people shouldn't be able to uh, write what is contained in stolen documents. Um, what you don't read in The Guardian is that The Guardian consented to super injunction. They agreed to it by consent. Uh, uh, and then it was leaked um, to a former observer journalist who was in the um, House of Commons, who, who raised the subject in the House of Commons, and that destroyed it. But if newspapers, and I, I don't have any evidence, it's just my opinion, uh, leak super injunctions to MPs and they raise it in the House, that, that's going to attack the rule of law, because if a judge makes an order injuncting something, then an MP doesn't like it and then raises it in the House, then there's no point having injunctions at all. Um, so there, there, there is a point, though, isn't there, that you know, if you breach a super injunction, whether you do it on a blog on the internet you know, or, or, or even on a tweet, um, you know, or, you, or, or someone slips something to a, an MP who, who mentions it in, in the House of Commons, you are breaking the rule of law. No, the rule of lawyers, not the same thing as the rule okay. of law at all. Explain. Uh, <laughs> Explain. Uh, I think it was very clear from the public reaction when, through this turn of events, it became plain what this report was all about, that the general public, were quite, it was quite clear to them that we had done the right thing and we had acted in the public interest. Um, Nigel sometimes says this about, oh, the Guardian consented to this super injunction as though this is an answer to something. Faced with this bizarre super injunction, we had a, uh, we had a dilemma. What do we do? <coughs> now, it was so outrageous that we could have spent our time appealing and go appealing to the Supreme Court, and appealing to Strasbourg, if you like, and spending the next seven years and spending a couple of million pounds on fighting this injunction, knowing we would get it overturned in the end, and you know, by then everybody would have forgotten what it was all about. That's one route. It's a route lawyers would like you to take because it involves massive legal fees for all concerned. What happened instead was an MP became aware of it and decided themselves, which is their job to be MPs and represent the public, that it was in the public interest to make it known. And so they put down a question in Parliament. Carteruck then made this dumb attempt to stop people <coughs> from reporting parliamentary questions and got themselves into a bit of a firestorm of bad well, publicity. We didn't make any attempt, as you know, David. Um, you asked us whether the injunction allowed for, had a provision for, for reporting what happened in Parliament. Because no one thought that it was going to be leaked to an MP, no one had put in the court order that uh, this doesn't prevent reporting in Parliament. No one had ever thought about it. It's never been in any of my super injunctions. I've never thought that one of my celebrity super injunctions would be... Uh, would end up being spoken about in Parliament. So I have got an order saying it can be. Uh, okay. You just haven't thought about it. Well, I'm not going to be it. mean about this. It wasn't Nigel who drew up this, what he describes as an incompetent super injunction. So he's not personally to blame for Carter Ruck screwing up. Can I just clarify what before we... We didn't screw up. OK, well, let, let, let's... Yeah, just before we um, move, I think we've answered two of your questions. I think that's probably fair. And we'll come on to another... So just, bad. Just, not bad. I just want yeah. to clear up one thing. It, because the perception I think most people have was that this was uh, an attempt to prevent a question being asked. There is a distinction, isn't there, however, between the question being asked, which presumably is covered by parliamentary privilege, but the report, it's the reporting of that question that can be um, in breach of the injunction. Is that, is that right, broadly? Parliament's decided, and it's going to have another look at it, because I, I know the Culture Media Committee are quite exercised by all this, but uh, Parliament has decided that there's no absolute privilege for reporting what's happened in Parliament. You have to be bona fides in, in, when you report something. And there is an argument that if you're the subject of an injunction, uh, you can't be acting bona fide by, by writing something that's in breach of that injunction. 
Right. So, and this goes back to the Parliamentary Papers Act of sort of 1847 or something, doesn't yes, it? It's, yes, yes. So I mean, it's, it's Parliament hasn't caught up with the internet age quite yet. No, but uh, um, so it was last looked at about ten years ago, uh, and Parliament decided that MPs ought to just behave themselves and not raise questions in the House, which was subject to court proceedings. Um, there was a, a very famous case where the Court of Appeal decided a child shouldn't be named. Uh, and an MP said, well, I don't agree with that. Just name the child uh, in the House of Commons. Um, but if the House of Commons doesn't respect what the courts do, then you will have a breakdown in the rule of law. Um, okay. can, I just, can I just check one thing? I, I was interested in this point that, that a super injunction is justified if the naming of the injunction would have a devastating impact on, on the subject. What would the devastating impact have been on Traffic Era had it just been said that there was an injunction? Um, Traffic Era, right at, in, at the end of settling 30,000 claims for personal injury, uh, and I, it would have had a devastating effect on an attempt to settle, I think, if this, if this document came out and the, or the, pre the press wrote articles trying to s suggest they were uh, suppressing freedom of expression. I don't know. I mean, devastating would have bankrupted the company? Would have? Uh, well, the, the judge decided that uh, it would stimulate anti traffic era. Um, Clearly, it would have done, but it wouldn't so, have been devastating. No, not, not devastating in the financial but sense. But did the judge right? get it wrong? Uh, well, he held the fort. You know, it was like, a, I don't know what day of the week it was, but what, what typically happens in these cases is you run to the court as a matter of urgency, you get a duty judge who's not necessarily familiar with the area of the law. He says, I'm going to grant an injunction until Friday, you know, when you can have a, a whole day in court to, to argue this thing. This is typ typically what's happened. And the Friday came along. and uh, uh, So you're just holding the fort for two or three days. And you, you come along to the Friday. And in this case, the Guardian said, oh, actually, we're going to agree with the super injunction being um, continued. So there was never actually a real but your argument about it, although the, the Guardian did oppose it. Your in the half-hour hearing. But, your uh, instinct is that the initial judge, as you say, was, 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 most was judges holding in, the fort, but probably Most judges, when I apply, will hold the fort, as, as I call it, uh, just for a couple of days. Because if they don't grant the injunction uh, and it all gets out, then it's too late. So they prefer to grant an injunction so it can be fully, up, fully argued two days later uh, in court. And do you think but it never have, was. Do you think you would have lost that argument? Um, I, I kind of, it depends on the evidence. I think. Um, What's your instinct? I would have pressed David Lee to swear an affidavit that the uh, Guardian had ne didn't leak the super, super injunction to the MP. But if none and of that I had have got that oh, affidavit. I think that would have been a breach of privilege. <laughs> no, but, well, I wouldn't, that. That, I wouldn't have got that affidavit. I wouldn't have got that affidavit. And so I'd have, I'd have told the judge. But if none well, of that had happened, you just, if, you, if, if two days had passed and you'd argued it properly, would that super injunction have, have held or not? Were you uh, just trying it on, in other words? Yeah, of course no, they were just trying it on. I think yeah. everyone tries it on. Um, <laughs> I think you, you lawyers do it all the time. You, 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 you say, we don't know if this will work, but we'll give it a go. You, you, you're, given, you're, you're given maybe one or two hours notice sometimes before you go into court. It's, it's yeah, like an emergency the, operation. the initial for, one. I'm saying in the second time, with two days of considered thought, you would, probably wouldn't have got it, would you? Um, I mean, I simply, don't, I simply don't know. It would have depended on the evidence. Um, but I think if the answer was probably yes, you'd say probably yes. Uh, Whereas I think if the answer was probably no, you'd be a bit more ambivalent. Well, you might be right, but I, I, I'm, I'm just giving you that. I, I, I think we're going to stop that cross-examination <laughs> at that point. I, um, uh, I, I David, you wanted to say something. I'm, I'm it, very keen I, to move on to other questions as well. Could I just mention one thing about Traffic Ura case? I mean, it struck me sitting on the sideline that Traffic Ura actually had quite a good case on the, co on the confidentiality and the... Uh, and one of their, and it was a draft report. Uh, but uh, this over muscular thing, one sees it a lot with claimants, this sort of over muscular approach to litigation, really, in my view, uh, grabbed defeat out of the jaws of victory. Um, and, and it left Trafigura, who had a perfectly decent claim, it seemed to me, um, looking um, far, far worse. And if they, if they just let things take their course, which ultimately is what they had to do. Let's move on to another question. Uh, I'm just going to think who had their hand up first. I think it was this gentleman in the blue jumper. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm curious about uh, two things. Firstly, uh, people uh, having a reputation to defend. Certainly the BCA, the leaflet that they originally printed, they've since had to withdraw because of the Advertising Standards Authority. So there's a question there about their uh, 
reputation and, and how reliable they're seen to be. And some of the people that have taken out these injunctions saying, yes, I've got a reputation to defend here, are pretty disreputable, wretched people, and I'm sure you've met them, you must know this. Uh, and uh, uh, secondly... What you've read in the press. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, a, there's also a personal cost here, and I'm curious as to whether if you are a, a lawyer involved in uh, shutting these things down, you know, you are keeping, keeping valuable information from the economy. It slows down the economy. It slows down progress in medicine. Certainly with Simon's case, that's, that's true. And, you know, can, there, there must come a point where you feel that this would go too far. I mean, there must be cases, for example, with people like Peter Wilmshurst who raised concerns about medical devices and things like that. You know, there are, there are cases here where this is really serious. It's not about tittle-tattle. And if you were to go to hospital... Uh, and try out a treatment where the full range of information about that treatment had not been properly published, even in an academic journal, even with a limited audience, surely you would want to know. I mean, there must come a point where the, the personal financial benefit to you of keeping this going it out outweighs the, think, the cost yeah. of science. Okay. Well, it's the yeah, it's a question I often ask uh, to lawyers. If, if I went know. to hospital, I, I would want to know that my, I, I had a way of stopping the news of the world publishing what's in my medical records. Uh, but. My firm is well known for acting for a Danish scientist who uh, uh, said that a drug company was uh, selling drugs which were dangerous to people. Uh, he was sued and we gave him a no-win, no-fee deal uh, and we defended him. Uh, but, you know, I don't want my medical records uh, coming out in the news of the world either. So uh, one has to res respect freedom of speech, but one has to respect people's privacy. Uh, and our medical records aren't really going to uh, help public debate or speed up the economy. Well, yeah. medical records, but information about medicine, uh, the, the ability of uh, academic journals to publish about treatments well, and whether or not they, they work. I mean, that's the, the, the typical that's pharmaceutical work. company doctor libel action arises out of this. The doctor says, these drugs are dangerous, and they know it. And they're suppressing all the reports uh, which tell them that their, their drug is dangerous and they're suppressing them because they're making millions and millions of pounds a day. So the, he's accused, the typical libel action of the pharm pharmaceutical company is where they're accused of outright dishonesty. Um, and they go ballistic. Uh, they may be <laughs> but when you say typical, the last four that I can think of are Henry Thompson, myself, Ben Goldacre, and Peter Wilmshurst. I think all of us were doing a pretty decent job of being journalists or doctors or medical researchers. And all of us have suffered at the hands of libel lawyers. I, I don't think you can see those as being reasonable well, or fair cases. Uh, Henrik uh, Thompson case is over. Yeah. Your, your case is probably effectively won. I don't know enough about it, but you've had a historic victory. Um, had two years of hell. Well, yeah. You have, yes. But, I nearly but, lost it but, on several occasions. Lost it but, um, internally <laughs> as well as... <laughs> but, but just, I mean, just to def defend you, the problem is not Carter Ruck. Um, your job is to be a very good law firm. Um, and you're a very good law firm. Your, your job is to act within what the laws allow you to do, and, and, and you do a very good job of that. The problem is that the law is as it is. The law allows you to have 100% uplift, and so you're going to take it. The law allows you to, um, to, to, to bring in libel to it, and so you do. Um, the, the law is the problem, not, not necessarily Carter Ruck or Schilling. Can I, can I just pick up on that? It's not completely the case. The thing that gets me is that... <clears throat> Libel Tories, a lot of these cases are about libel tourism. Uh, American companies, pharmaceutical companies, sue here about things people say over there. Every time there's a ruling here that some Ukrainian oligarch or whatever can sue, it puts money in the pocket of British lawyers. And this is like a wonderful invisible export. Good for exports, David. Hmm? Good for exports. Good for exports, exactly. And what I've got against people like uh, Eby as a judge is when they make these rulings that, yes, people have standing to sue over here, even if they don't have much to do with here, they're putting money in the pockets of lawyers. And it's all like a bit of a club. And it's one of the evils of the present system. And it's one of the things that the Libel Review said that it would tighten up, actually, isn't it? Except that. The judges don't want to stop libel tourism. Lord Hoffman made a speech saying libel tourism, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, Edie made a speech saying the same thing. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, I'm more optimistic because I, when I talk to lawyers and I talk to judges, they're not involved in libel typically. The vast majority of the legal system looks at the libel laws and is embarrassed by them. They're quite proud of British justice and English justice. And they, they look at some of the libel. Uh, 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 verdicts and they look at some of the libel cases 
and they want it changed as well. And that's why I'm much more optimistic than, than perhaps you are. On well, that doesn't quite work because, of course, all the, all the libel cases go in front of specialist libel judges. And it was certainly said by the judge who did the McDonald's case, which lasted about a year. He said, in you know, most of the work I do, um, common sense gives me the answer to 90% uh, of, of the time. In libel, the statistic is the other way around. <laughs> yes. Um, David, I was interested when you said that um, the law doesn't have to change in this country if you are, I'm not going to say this in the right lingo, but you were saying that defamation is a problem and therefore you should protect the image of a company and you shouldn't go further than that. Whereas in America, you, if you are a huge company, you are seen as a public body, and therefore you have to defend yourself. So, for example, I made a film called Pig Business, and Smithfield Foods of America decided to threaten Channel 4 from showing that film. Now, in America, all of the evidence was that there was no malice from me, because it's everywhere that people who work in these pig factories are getting sick. So they could have easily shown it in America, but we couldn't hear. And are you saying that we shouldn't actually harm the reputation of that pig company, Smithfield Foods, and therefore we'll protect them over here and not have the same law as in America, where you actually have to prove it if you're a big company, whether you're going to have your reputation put through the mud or not? No, I think what I'm saying is there are three solutions. I mean, one is to leave things as they are. Uh, the other, which I think is the one I prefer, to say that companies ought to um, be required to prove actual damage. Um, so, so at least you would be able to uh, have an argument as to whether your film uh, caused damage to the company, which by the sounds of things it wouldn't have. But it or, would or, have. or the third alternative, sorry, if I can just do the third alternative, uh, is malicious uh, falsehood, which is getting a bit closer um, going a bit closer to um, what happens in the states, but not quite as far. Where you would have, you would actually, uh, they would actually have to show that you were acting maliciously, which obviously they couldn't. So I mean, there are three solutions, and I think I, I prefer probably solution two or possibly solution three, which is what you got with councils. But the point of showing this company as doing these things to these people's health and to the pigs was to say to everybody, watch out what this company is doing. So it was going to damage their reputation. But in America, they'd have had to prove that the things that were said in the film were not true, and they couldn't have, because it's, it's everywhere in all of the newspapers and all of the medical reports that people get sick. So why can't we damage their reputation? Why are you stopping? Why can't we just totally adopt the American system where the company has to prove they're innocent and unless there's malice? Of Proved from the accuser. Well, the English—I mean, the English courts have very clearly set their face against um, um, complete liberty hall with companies, and I, I don't think you're going to get that area of the law law changed. I mean, um, why company. Not? Why not, David? Why not? Well, because I mean, I mean, company companies do have reputation. I mean, ultimately, um, ultimately, I, um, I think most people would say, I mean. The pendulum needs to, to swing a bit, but but that you cannot um, have a thing where people can say anything untrue that they like about a company. But David, you said definitely option two, possibly option three. Yeah. So you, you're almost there. Yeah. So well, should we just go to the floor? Anyone uh, else have a have a strong view on on that? Feels that we should move more to the American system. I know, gentlemen, I'll come to your question in, in a moment. Is is that on something another point? Okay. Anyone else? Just before we get to that, anyone else? On. on, on. Yeah. So I would like to answer it. Um, um, touching on one of the. Did anyone hear that? By the way, we have the lawyer who. Okay, we have the lawyer here who acted on the other side. We have the filmmaker and we have the lawyer for the other side. So we could, as I said at the beginning, we could refight so many of these battles. But yes. 
So, yeah, you know, now we have this, you know, now we have this halfway house. I mean, you know, if we went to this a situation where we were only looking at malice, then, you know, you can't be reckless as to the truth. Whereas now we have Reynolds, which is a very important tool, I think, for the halfway house, where, you know, you need to put the allegations and the other, you need to include this reportage. So there is a, there is a very adequate halfway house, you know, for where there's a public interest um, under the current system. And I think not enough journalists really know how to use Reynolds. I think Edie said recently it's, it's something very expensive, only big organisations can use it. But journalists also feel that there are, it, it, there are so many hoops to jump through uh, on Reynolds. But uh, no, that's not really true. You've basically got to, you've got to tell the other side you know, the precise allegations, give them a meaningful opportunity to give their side, and you've got to include the gist of it. I mean, that's kind of all that's required. Um, so I think, you know, at the end of the day, before you know, people look at absolutes, you know, there should be much more use of that, which is possible. I mean, maybe what we will see is, I think, that turned into a sort of statutory defence. I mean, I think that may be... Well, there, yeah, that's what well I suggested. that's a very good point. I yeah. mean, as a working journalist, you know, I try and use Reynolds a lot, and I've come round to thinking that you can operate within this framework of responsible journalism, and you can do it. I can be responsible, if you like. You know, I can make it work, Another journalist can Problem is that people like Edie have made it difficult and expensive because they've been very hostile to Reynolds and they've, they've made people jump through hoops all the time. And he really, he sort of psychologically, he doesn't get it about Reynolds. So it's very difficult. And you need to have a lawyer sitting on your knee, really. So you, you would back a statutory, robust public interest defense? I think that's right. Um, I mean, um, yeah, I think that's probably the way forward. We do, you know, we, you know, and the House of Lords have tried to promote it. I mean, what Reynolds is really trying to do, it's the judiciary's attempt to break through this real issue and to say, you know, move away from tabloidization and go to respond. We're trying to bring professional responsibility to the journalistic profession, and here's how you should do it. You know, verify your facts, behave responsibly, and you need public interest. And you can basically then print what you like, you know, if you work within that framework. I, I'm assuming Nigel would agree with that as well. Um, let's take your case, Simon. If yeah. there was a, a statutory defence of fair comment, right, the Court of Appeal wouldn't have been able to say, right, we're just going to abolish fair comment, we're going to call it honest opinion, we're going to give greater flexibility to articles about science and medicine, um, and, you know, find, and with a very strong message to the junior judges to find in favour of defendants in these cases. They wouldn't be able to do that. The advantage of judge-made law is that you have flexibility, and most of the time it, it can respond to overwhelming public opinion. If you put Reynolds in a, in a statute, then it does gives the judges very little room for manoeuvre, and Edie would be applying it and applying it, and the defendants would be losing and losing, if, if David is to be... He's be, applying be, it so wonderfully at the moment. It just strikes but, me but that... There are no, other no, I rather agree with Nigel. Uh, there there, there are other judges who, well, because it's flexible, and they want to see a defendant win in a particular case, but they will apply it so flexibly that the defendant wins. Mm -hmm. But if you don't give them any room for manoeuvre, it actually suppresses... But, but what uh, frightens journalists is that when the costs are so huge and when the duration of the case is so long, knowing where you stand from the outset is, is a huge bonus, as opposed to wondering which judge you're going to get and how they're going to implement it a year and a half down the line. Can, can we... Do, do you want to respond to that? No. Or, yeah. l l we had a point on... We touched on costs again, and we had a point about costs at the back. You, uh, people are forgetting to say Hi, who they are. I think are I've got already. a microphone here. Is this working? Yeah. Um, just, just to let you know um, who I am. I'm Thomas Gomez. I've just launched an online news site called the Periscope Post. So I guess I'm a publisher. Um, that was after choosing to leave the only less popular profession, which was uh, as a lawyer. I practiced uh, as a corporate lawyer for five years at Cravath in New York and then qualified as a solicitor. Um, here in the UK, and I give you that background just because it's relevant to the question. There was a question by Simon to Nigel about um, why we couldn't reduce the costs involved uh, in, in libel uh, litigation. And Nigel's response was um, that the costs of suing a newspaper have become incredibly high and it's much more difficult and expensive to do that. And uh, in support of that, you, you described some applications and filings. Now, not having admittedly been uh, specifically in IP law, some, some of the things that you described seemed that they would n nowhere near get approximate the, the costs involved on the other side. I mean, some of these applications can be done by a first-year first lawyer in about five minutes and would incur really a very minimal uh, increase in costs. So I was wondering if you could clear up 
um, a little more concretely how, how it is you think that those costs can justify not bringing down the overall costs? Um, very quickly, costs in libel actions have gone up for three reasons. Uh, the first is changes to procedure, which requires lawyers to do uh, several times more work. Um, the, it can be done by first year assistants and then, then amended by partners, uh, but it, it, you still have to do much more work. Drafting witness statements, serving 20 witness statements, you wouldn't believe how much work is involved in, in doing that. And I didn't have I feel to do like that I've done I that a few times though. Okay. Uh, the second driver of costs has been uh, changes in the law. Um, the, the press used to just be able to plead uh, truth to an article and then lose, but now they can plead Reynolds privilege to an article which doubles the costs and then they lose. Uh, so all these additional defenses, that you know, the offer of amends, fair comments, there'll be more fair comment cases coming along, uh, people emboldened by Simon's victory, but that will drive up uh, costs. So pro-defendant defenses uh, drive up costs. And the third driver of costs has been the no-win, no-fee system, uh, which by itself has driven up costs by, uh, at some extremes, by about 250%, because it allows, uh, if a case goes to trial, the claimant lawyer to, to double what he charges, and on top of that is no win, no fee insurance as well, which can add another 50% of the cost. So all that put together ha has driven up costs dramatically. Um, but it, it's no good saying to lawyers, uh, you have to do five times the amount of work, but we're only going to pay you uh, the same as what you earned 20 years ago, because it's just not economic. Um, well, that's what's been happening with legal aid, actually. Some many lawyers would argue that you know, people have, not quite as dramatically perhaps as that, but lawyers have had to tighten their belts and do more work for less. But, you know, barristers earning £200 to a, d a day trying to defend someone on murder. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, well, I mean, that, you know, it's, a, it's a different argument, but, uh, you know, the, the figures published by the, uh, you know, I mean, perhaps you can apply it to private practice in a way, but the figures published recently by the MOJ on, you know, the, the top earning um, legal aid barristers, the, the top earning criminal uh, Silk, I think, was earning about nine hundred and fifty thousand. Well, there pounds. was a few at the top, but there are, yeah. yeah. But, but but the fact is, most criminal barristers will tell you that with graduated fees, you know, they were, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're having to do more for less. Things like uh, disclosure, they're having to do effectively for free, um, and you know, well, legal, why not apply a bit of that? Legal to, aid to lawyers have to take on legal aid cases, but I, I don't have to work a, a loss or whatever. Um, well, what you've accepted, which is a tribunal, uh, it's one suggestion. Would be fantastic. Yeah, but. Um, Touching on success fees, uh, why am I opposed to them being driven down? Um, one straightforward answer is that the defendants, Henrik Thompson, pro probably you, I don't know, but I, I don't know whether your lawyers would have defended you on a 10% success fee. I don't know. It would have been quite they a... They weren't on a CFA at all. I thought you had a CFA lawyers in a uh, court of appeal. Very late in the day, in my the barristers appeal, came in yeah. on a CFA. Right. Uh, so they were a fat lot of good to me. You know, if I'm acting for a doctor who's being sued by a pharmaceutical company, and, and uh, we did one trial which lasted three months, for example, it used up about a third of the firm's resources, uh, and there's a 10% success fee for me, I, I, I don't think we'd take the case on. It's just uneconomic. Yeah, well, this, uh, is, uh, yeah. this is the problem is that with these success fees is that you can do a fiddle. The idea is the 100% success fee is to compensate the law firm for all the cases they've taken on where they didn't win. Uh, so if you're a smart lawyer, what you do is somebody comes along with an iffy case, you say, no thanks, forget it, I don't want to know. They come along with a surefire winner, they say, yeah, I'll take that, take 100% success fee. That way, you put the money in the bank, you buy yourself a yacht. What, what, yeah. the what were the chances of Henry Thompson winning his case, defending it successfully? Uh, it's always 50%, because you get, then get 100% uplift. No, no, but the chances of him winning? Um, I didn't handle the case myself. Take a but, guess. Um, I thought we had a probably, uh, from what I know, we had a better and even chance. But oh, I mean, come on, be realistic. Better than even is, is, is means nothing. Well, uh, I don't know enough about the case. Sorry, I didn't handle it. Um, Take a guess. <laughs> well, I think he um, had a pretty good case. Well, yeah, he he had a, uh, okay, let's say he had a good case. But I'll, I'll stage success fee system at Carter. So if he, had, if he had a very good chance of winning his case, and let's call it even seventy-five percent, you know, which is maybe as high as you can ever go with the uncertainties in the law. You did not need a 100% uplift in order to justify backing him. I think that's what people are arguing about. We need to drive down the 100%, maybe to 25, maybe to 10. But what happens is you have staged uplift. So 
In most cases, you get 25% success fee. If it goes a certain distance, you get a 50% success fee. And if it goes to trial, you get a 100% success fee. And the idea is if it goes to trial, then that means that both parties think they've got a 50-50 case at least, otherwise they wouldn't be going to trial. So you don't get 100% in cases, even if you think they're 50-50. Uh, most of our cases, you get nothing or 25%. Uh, well, the, 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 truth of the, matter, the truth of the matter is that even the judges are shocked by the level of the yeah. success fees. You, and uh, Court of Appeal Judge Lady Justice Smith recently referred to the whole system as absolutely iniquitous. You, you've, you've just contradicted yourself, because earlier on you said the CFAs lead to a was it 225 or 325 percent? 250 percent, yeah. 250 increase. So you're, yeah. you're clearly saying that this is more than doubling the cost. So the 100% uplift well, is clearly I, I, unjustified. I agree that success fees should come... And it's clearly a reality. I agree, personally, that success yeah. fees should come down. Uh, but rushing it through in three or four weeks and, and saying it's 10 percent will have an effect. It will stop people uh, having lawyers represent them. It will. Does, uh, anyone, uh, want, does anyone on the floor, on the floor want to come yeah. in on this? Because the argument is that, you know, if you reduce success fees to 10%, you actually, there's a real access to justice um, problem and that worthy cases just won't get taken on because the lawyers aren't going to make enough money out of it. Does anyone, does anyone have any views on, on that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, just wait, if you can just tell us who you um, are. My name's Natasha Lode at The Economist. My case never actually got taken up, but it was to do with something I blogged. Um, but, you know, when I consulted the, the lawyer, they did off me this arrangement which I'd never heard of before and um, so obviously if that arrangement wasn't there I wouldn't have been able to defend myself. Yeah and if it's and if the rewards for the lawyers are lower there's less chance of them offering right. it. Right I mean when he explained the deal I was like wow that can't be true but he's like well yeah it is and it means that I'm happy to take this on because you know um, it's a good deal mm. so but, but you know I take the point about driving up costs and you know as a journalist I feel that the broader issue is more important than than you know my particular situation at the time and I think costs are just just totally out you know it's a question of access to justice as well um, so yeah. yeah Hugh Thomas at the back one Th there's a, a lot of things I'd like to reply to in the the debate but uh, um, I'll just say one thing about costs that Costs uh, in English litigation generally are a scandal. I mean, by European standards, they're massively higher. It's not just libel. I mean, libel, actually, if you look at... Um, th th there's a case involving Wembley Stadium where the judge... Th th the photocopying costs alone were £2 million. <laughs> and and the, the total... The, the sum recovered was, I think, £40,000, and the costs were £25 million. Now, Now, exactly why that is, I mean, it's, it's partly due to the... Uh, you know, the way that English lawyers have changed in my lifetime from being, uh, you know, a gentleman's profession to being a multinational business uh, uh, in a different way to continental lawyers. And that's affected libel law at the edges, actually, but it has affected libel law. What we do about it, I mean, I, you know, Lord Justice Jackson has some proposals. Uh, 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 they're not very radical, actually. I mean, that's a very deep and difficult question. But for the media to suggest that somehow it's it's to do with iniquitous libel lawyers is, is simply not right. I mean, it's a it's a much more uh, difficult cultural problem. In relation to CFAs, I mean, everybody in the law hates CFAs because they put you into a, a partnership with your client. I mean, you effectively have an economic interest in the case. Nobody likes them. The question is, is there a better way of providing access to justice? Uh, and, and unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be in the current economic climate because you can't get legal aid for a lot of cases. Is 100% success fee too high? It obviously is in libel cases. But 10% is obviously too low. I mean, the government's own advisor wrote to the House of Lords Merits Committee saying that he'd been asked to look at the evidence, and there was none. And the government actually had no evidence at all to back the 10% figure. I mean, if you, if you, what evidence there is suggests the proper figure is probably about 40%. But it's obviously sensible that evidence should be looked at. I mean, evidence is a big problem in this area. Uh, just to take two examples that have been talked about. Libel tourism, uh, what evidence there is suggests there wasn't a single libel tourist case last year at all. I mean, there wasn't a single case where a foreigner had sued a foreigner in the English courts. But it would be nice to know what the figures were, and the government doesn't collect them, and that's a very bad thing. Super injunction's the same. I mean, I personally think there's probably about 20 in existence, but because the government doesn't collect the figures, nobody knows. I mean, libel actions 
I, I hear, you know, the libel capital of the world. The European average for libel actions is 700 per country per year. In England, it was 250 last year. I mean, Sweden, with a population of 8 million, has, or whatever it is, 10 million, has a lot more libel actions than England. Now, it's a very interesting, important debate to talk about freedom of expression and uh, libel actions, but it's important to have the facts uh, 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 and to, uh, and I think, I mean, Simon's campaign, which many aspects of which I disagree with, I mean, I think what's really important is if it actually forces the government to start collecting the figures so we actually know what we're talking about, massive progress would have been made. What does it tell you, the fact that there are 200 cases in Sweden of, of libel? I was, I think Sorry, I was more, a lot more. There's a lot more than that. Well, more, what the, does that tell you? Well, what, what it tells me is libel, libel cases are about protecting reputation. Now, we, the, the thing about this debate, which makes it r rather sort of, in a way, abstract, is nobody, the Guardian doesn't attack people's reputation unnecessarily. Most of the time, the Guardian acts completely responsibly. The tabloids, on the other hand, think they can write what they like and they can get away with it. And if you have a malicious falsehood test, the tabloids just claim falsely to have confidential sources, which they won't reveal. You can't prove malice, and so they can get away with saying anything they like. Can why you answer my question? Why, why are there libel actions in Sweden? Because people uh, attack other people's reputation in Sweden. It needs to be defended. The Swedes are much nastier than in this country. No, 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 no it's not, not, not nothing to do with nastiness. Could it, I'll give you a clue. Could it be cost that people can actually afford to defend their article in Sweden? No, well, I, I just said, I, I just said to you, uh, uh, I mean, perhaps you weren't listening, that, that, that libel costs uh, and costs of litigation generally are a big problem in England. It's a no, big no, cultural problem. I asked you problem. a very straightforward question. What you said, you know, it, it's as though this is a place where people are suing people for libel all over, the, all over the place, whereas in fact, in other countries, it's far more common, uh, as, as though they have a bigger problem than we have. So I asked you a very straightforward question. Why are there so many cases well, in, let's say, Sweden, you evaded the question. No, I didn't evade the question. And eventually, you did a pretty good job. And then eventually, you admitted it's an issue of cost. All right, I'm, I'm going to just step in at this point, just in case this gets. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't. I don't, I don't want to. The, the oh, I, th I think what you said, uh, what, what he, what he said was that costs are a huge problem. Costs are a um, huge problem in England, and it's not. It, it's how to okay. solve it is not straightforward. Oh, oh, I rather agree with the libel tribunal point, yeah. actually. Okay, let's let's move on to an, another question. Uh, we're sort of fast running out of time. We've got about eight minutes. So, uh, who do raise your hand if you'd like to? Ask a question before our eight minutes. Oh, maybe, maybe we can allow you to, to bat on for a bit longer. Um, any, any further questions? Well, well, can I just say something in favor of lawyers? Because yeah. uh, you know, I think it's a bit unfair that all these journalists here should be having a go at the lawyers. There is a problem about my own trade, uh, and it's exemplified by the McCann case, in which the tabloids slagged off these people <coughs> and defamed these people mercilessly and ruthlessly and, and recklessly. And they were able to go to Carter Ruck and get redressed. And unless we put the newspaper house in order, um, it's very difficult to move the debate about libel reform further forward. Because what happens is, every time you say, look, it's all chilling. And I say, you know, decent people like me, we can't write stuff. Publishers can't publish things. Everybody says, what about the tabloids? They've got to be stopped. That's the sort of ED approach, really, that you know, there are these terrible people out there doing terrible things. So we've got to reform the newspapers, actually. Well, nine months ago, the tabloids were saying that, uh, well, effectively, that the, the, our privacy, the privacy law had, had put their house in order. And you know, a lot of people took the view that the privacy law had done what the press complaint uh, council had failed to do for, for years and years. I mean, uh, what do we need to do? Let, well, perhaps we'll throw this question open. Well, what, what do we need to do to reform our, our press? And I presume you're talking about the, the tabloid press predominantly. Well, I was in favor, for example, <coughs> of the introduction of custodial sentences for, uh, for hacking, for breaches of the Data Protection Act. I was thoroughly in favor of putting journalists in jail for that. There was a great caterwauling from my colleagues on the tabloids about it. A few journalists go to jail. Um, the last newspaper editor to go to prison was, I think, in 1940. Uh, Yes, gentlemen. Thank back. you. My name's Lloyd Bracey. Could I say a personal thanks to uh, David because um, uh, a certain Jonathan Aiken took legal action against me when I was editor of a TV news program at the time of the BMARC inquiry, which I'm sure you'll remember. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, he withdrew his case magically and promptly when certain papers turned up thanks to the work of your, uh, your colleagues. So many thanks for that. Um, the answer to what I would put forward as a, as a starting point 
to get some uh, the, the, the media's house in order, the tabloid's house in order, is a press complaints commission that was worthy of the name, because that's not what we have in this country. Perhaps it's something like um, a, a tribunal could, could, could be seen to seem the same sort of role, whereas a case like Simon's, and more power to your elbow, Simon, um, could end up with you know, a tribunal ruling on that, a press complaints commission saying, here's, here's an adequate response to the article, which they are more or less obliged to carry. But as long as the Sun can carry its correction on page 17 in a down par one paragraph, then I can't see that, that, that the commission has any teeth at all. So my first uh, suggestion is, can we have a press complaints commission, please? So we haven't got one at the moment. Yeah, anyone want to <coughs> pick up on that? Or, uh, I mean, we've got broadcast journalists here as well. What, 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 is, what is the difference between Ofcom and the PCC in the sense that people tend to think that Ofcom works reasonably well and almost well, well, very, very, very few people have that view of the PCC. Yeah. And, I, and actually, I'll answer it bearing in mind that the distinction between the two media is becoming increasing. But the Sun's got a TV channel now, yeah. I think. Of it. But Ofcom doesn't have any legal remit to investigate or to deal with uh, uh, internet matters at the moment. I think it's quite one, but it doesn't have it at the moment. But the answer surely is that Ofcom has power. Ofcom can find broadcasters. Uh, it can take away licenses. I mean, Ofcom is a statutory body, whereas the PCC is a private body, and you know they do come up with some pretty weird decisions. And I think also the perception is that it's pretty well controlled by the press, although it is just a it is just a lay majority. I mean, you've got a fairly good nucleus of press, there, and certainly one of one of the proposals seems to be that there should be power to fine. Um, and we, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the PCC yeah. is a fraud. Yeah. I think pa Patrick. I just, have, I just had a question, if, if, if I yeah, may. Sure. Just going back to something, Nigel, that you said much earlier on about when we were discussing um, a way, um, perhaps a more efficient way to sort out perhaps m more minor cases, perhaps through a tribunal, and this has been mentioned. Um, and then you mentioned things that might be online. Is there a distinction? between online and in print? I mean, if, if, if someone came to you with a complaint that was made, that was perhaps libelous and made online, would you treat that any differently? Clients treat it differently. Um, if they see something in a newspaper, they think it's going to be believed more, whereas uh, people are more skeptical, skeptical about what they see online. And if, if something's taken down after a complaint, um, they don't generally want to press for damages. They're, as long as they get their costs paid, you know, that's, that's fine. Whereas their attitude is very different if something's published in a hard copy of a, a newspaper. You know, they want to really go for them sometimes. Um, I, I just think with on, online complaints, where, where the damage is, perhaps an article's just been up for a few days, um, and the circulation is only a few hundred people, for example, it doesn't need the Rolls-Royce treatment of a, a high court judge and a jury. Uh, it can just be dealt with by a specialist tribunal, uh, uh, maybe an internet tribunal, dealing with that kind of thing. Um, but, but online is a, I mean, we're talking about newspapers here, but the, the problem is that whatever, whatever um, problems the newspapers have, it's the local newspapers, it's the academic journals, it's the scientists, it's the bloggers who are all suffering with this same libel law. And so um, you'll know more of these cases than, than, than I will, but uh, I think Mumsnet was threatened with libel or sued for libel for a discussion by its members. Um, uh, there was a, a blogger, and when I say blogger, I mean really good journalism, uh, being threatened by libel uh, by uh, a, by a group of homeopaths. Um, this a professor of pharmacology at UCL, uh, fantastic blogger, threatened with libel. Um, university withdrew his blog. Um, so these are the the, the threat of libel we, we, has a really David's serious impact. point is, is well made. You, you have to have libel laws to deal with the ferocity yeah. of the, the tabloid press. So um, if they won't behave themselves, you have to have fairly strict laws. It, it means everyone else suffers, though. But you can't relax the laws uh, to help the bloggers unless you have a t twin system of, of A robust law. statutory public interest defense would go a long uh, way to differentiating the two. Uh, We're getting uh, a nod here from the front row, from a colleague. Statutory public interest defense would be a disaster. And I'm very happy to uh, tell you about it. Could you explain why it wouldn't be a disaster? Because you're... 
Yeah, I, I think, think we may we may have to um, sort that one out in the bar actually because uh, we certainly we've got to the time you allotted for the for the discussion and the debate. Um, that is time. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you all very much indeed for coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And perhaps you'd like to show your appreciation to the panel. <laughs>